Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters and my children, the subject, as has been announced, is the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word. In the world today, there are some 1,200 million Christians and 1,000 million Muslims, and they are at loggerheads on the subject of the revealed scriptures. The Christian, he says that the Bible, the Holy Bible is the word of God, and they will not accept another. And the Muslim says that the Quran is Allah's kalam, is the word of God. To begin this topic, I would like to explain to my brethren, first, what is the Bible? See, the bulk of our people, Muslims, even learned Muslims, they really do not know what the Bible is. I have been lecturing in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Bahrain, and at times, those of our brethren there in the Middle East, they would like to have my lectures translated. So, and I hear the translator translating the subject that I have been speaking on, for example, what the Bible says about Muhammad. So the translator says, what the Torah, you know, I can understand, I can't speak Arabic, but when the man is translating, I can understand, he's saying what the Torah says about Muhammad. So I interrupt the man, I say, I didn't say Torah. So he corrects himself. He says, what the Injil, in Arabic he's saying, what the Injil says about Muhammad. I said, I didn't say Injil. I said, what the Bible, Bible means a book. It comes from the Greek word Biblos. Biblos means a book, from which they get the word Bible. Holy Bible means holy book. Translate that, holy book. Instead of saying Torah, Zabur, Injil. So what is happening is that the Muslim gets caught out before he starts by admitting that this is Torah or Zabur or Injil. The Bible is not the Torah, it's not the Zabur, it's not the Injil. Now what we believe in is, we believe in four heavenly books. And we name them, we say, we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan. Furqan is the Holy Quran. Now what is Torah? Torah is the revelation, the Wahi, that Allah Bari Ta'ala gave to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. That is the Torah. We believe that Hazrat Musa alayhi salam was a man appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty. And whatever instructions were given through him is the Torah. Whatever. Was it given in a book form? No. The Quran was not given in a book form. See, it didn't come from heaven in this form. Allah gave by word form. Wahi. Tawar Zabur. Zabur is the revelation, the Wahi, that Allah Bari Ta'ala gave to Hazrat Dawud We believe that what was given was from Allah. The Injil. The Injil is the revelation, the Wahi, that Allah Bari Ta'ala gave to Hazrat Isa Jesus Christ. 
So whatever he preached was from Allah. We acknowledge it was the truth. But where is now the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil? Where are they? So the Christians and the Jews, they make certain claims. What is the Torah? So they will tell you that in this book, the Bible, which has a number of books, this is a, a, like a library. We are in the library building. This Bible is a library of 66 books inside. This is another Bible with a library of 73 books. That's also the Holy Bible. So you see, the, there is no such thing as Bible meaning one book. There are Bibles and Bibles, as you see. I have brought only three different types here, four actually. And they are all different. They are all different. There is no such thing as one Bible. So the first five books of this library, called the Bible, are named Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And these five books are supposed to be the books of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. They are supposed to be the Torah. But scholars, Christian scholars, they tell us, like in this one here, there are certain notes, editions, you know, to explain the such situation about the value of this book. And in that, they give you that, look, these five books, where did they come from? Who was the author? So they will tell you here that Genesis, that's the first book of the Bible. Genesis is the first book of Moses. But the term, the words first book of Moses are written in inverted commas. Exodus, the second book of Moses. The word second book of Moses written in inverted commas. Leviticus, third book of Moses in inverted commas. Numbers, fourth book of Moses in inverted commas. Deuteronomy, fifth book of Moses in inverted commas. So you ask the man, he says, why are these inverted commas? Why are you putting these words in inverted commas? So if you know, if you don't know, you ask the person, he says, no, this is not what we say. We are only telling you what people say. People say that these are the books of Moses, but we, 32 scholars of the highest eminence in Christendom, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they do not believe that these books are the books of Moses. Then why should you say these are the books of Moses? Why should you say this Torah when they themselves are not prepared to accept it? Who? The learned men of Christianity, not lay people, not ordinary people. And my friend, uh, Jimmy Swaggart, uh, he says in one of his books, I have purchased some 30 different books of his to know. See, you must know your opponent, you know. When you go into battle, you don't go with eyes closed. The Muslim is used to going eyes closed. He says, no, Allah is with us, and Allah Akbar, and he goes and gets killed. <laughs> you must know what the enemy has before you go into battle. We don't do homework, and we get hurt. Every time we get hurt. 1948, the Jews knocked hells into us. 56, they knocked hells into us. 67, they knocked hells into us. 73, we made a little effort. Had it not been for America going into direct intervention, we might have justified, you know, our rights. But however, it didn't happen. But every time we go into battle, we go with our eyes closed. Allah is there. Allah is great. Allah is great. But he's telling you, prepare, prepare. Be ready. He said, get ready against them, your strength to the utmost of your power. Even including streets of war. The most sophisticated weapons of the time. He's telling you, but he says, no, no. We are so many. We are a hundred million. You know, if you do such and such a thing, we can wash all the Jews into the sea. You know, it doesn't work that way. It's has been proven again and again and again. It doesn't work that way. So, this man, you know, writes brilliantly, he speaks, you know, uh, mesmer like a mesmerizer, he does mesmerize people. He says in one of his books that if we need factual information on any topic, we have to go to the experts. And he gives an example that if you want to know anything about geology, you go to the geologist. I said, it's a beautiful principle, it's a fantastic principle. You want to know about Sharia, go to the man who knows Sharia. If you want to have some medical problem, go to the doctor. If you have some legal problems, go to the lawyer. 
go to the professionals. So if we accept that, and no hesitation, go to the experts. Now the experts of Christendom, the experts of the Holy Bible, they are telling us that Moses didn't write these five books. But they don't tell you in that, those terms. Because then they won't be able to sell the book. So they put these things nicely, silently in inverted commas. It's left to you. If you have knowledge about inverted commas, only then you catch the joke. Otherwise, you miss the mark. <laughs> the internal evidence of the books also proves that Hazrat Musa didn't write them. I can go into endless you know, discussions. I can draw your attention to uh, numerous things. But I'll just give you two different places. One thing is that in these five books, no less than 700 times, you will read the expression, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord. When you, end, when you start just on the very superficial view of these phrases, you can understand that the Lord didn't write it, nor did Moses write it. See, it's third party. Somebody else is telling you what he has heard, maybe from hearsay. That you see, these were words given by God to Moses, and Moses again spoke like this and like that. If Hazrat Musa salam, Moses, if he had written these words, if he had noted them down, he would have said, and the Lord said unto me, and I said unto the Lord, and I spoke to the Lord, and the Lord said unto me. That's in the first person. This is somebody writing in the third person, that means, you know, speaking from hearsay. So Allah didn't dictate it, nor did Musa salam, write it. Very face of it. So can you blame the biblical scholars for telling us that Moses didn't write it? Put them in inverted commas. No, you can't blame them. Then in the last chapter of the last book, supposed to be the book of Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, we read about the obituary of Hazrat Musa salam. You know, obituary, when a man dies, you put some nice, beautiful epitaphs on his tombstone. You know, this, here lies Mr. Ahmad Didat, one of the um, great comparative uh, study, you know, scholars, students of religion, and so on and so on. You know, you might put it after I'm gone. Obituary. So, Hazrat Musa is supposed to have written his own obituary. Listen. It says, and there Moses died in the land of Moab. He died. He's alive, but he said he died in the land of Moab over against Beth Peer. And no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. No man knows about where his grave is up to today. Is this man walking in flesh and blood? Is he telling you that his grave is somewhere and nobody knows where it is today up to today? Did he write that? That he died when he was alive? Doesn't he know his language? That this is past tense? He's still alive and he says, I died. Oh, he could have made a prophecy. Like, if I were to make a prophecy, yes, as you know, I'm going to all over the country. I will be visiting Washington. And you know, I will die there in Washington. And Regan will attend my funeral. Maybe it won't even never happen, anything like that. But can you see now, I can say that now. That I, I think, well, you know, I had a dream, or somebody tickled me, and I heard some voices. to say, this is what is going to happen. I can tell you that, that I will die in Washington, D.C., and Regan and Mrs. Regan, they will attend my funeral. But, you know, when I'm still alive, how, how can I say that I died in Washington, D.C., and Regan was there? How can I say that? That I died when I'm talking to you now, I'm alive. Hazrat Musa salam, could never have uttered those words, that he died. Then it says, and Moses was. This is simple grammar, simple basic English. You know. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. Musa, Musa he's telling you that I was 120 years old when I died, when he's still alive. And his natural powers had not abated. You know, physically, he was still fit. I think I'm fit physically. I'm 69. He was twice my age. But he was fit. The wordings convey that if he had another 16-year-old for a wife, he could have done justice to her. You know, his natural powers, physical powers, sexual powers had not abated. He was still strong. Did Musa say that? You know, you think he would talk like that? 
telling people, he says, you know, I'm still all right. You know? <laughs> no, no. These are not his words. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Since in Israel. Since when? Did Musa say that? No. Can you see on the very face of it, these books are not the books of Hazrat Musa al-Islam. And hence, they are not the word of God. Then there are certain other things about these books, five books. In these five books, there are five cases of incest. Actually, I'm sorry, in the first book, leave out the five, the first one, Genesis, there are five cases of incest. And the bulk of the people in the Middle East, you know, when I was asking them, I said, please, put up your hands, those who don't know what incest is. And quite a fair proportion put up their hands. I said, look, nothing to be ashamed of. We don't have to, we, we can't claim that I know every word. Even sometimes, sometimes simple words, they beat me. So I said, please put up your hands. Those of you who do not know the meaning of the word incest, don't be ashamed, just put up your hands. If everybody knows, then I can carry on. If you don't, I will have to explain. Please put up your hands, those who don't know the word incest. If you don't know, all of you know, my sisters? You know what is incest? All of you know? Mashallah, mashallah. This is a stupendous discovery. No, it is a stupendous discovery. Very good. Well, of course, you are Americans, you see. I was talking about the Arabs. All right, for the benefit of those, you know, I could have like, um, Mullah Nasrullah, you know, he was a character among us. And uh, this character, he was reputed to be a very, very uh, knowledgeable person, Alim. He used to wear those nice big turbans and he used to have those jubbas, you know, not like me, you see. He used to have the jubbas and wherever he went, people flocked around him and they thought that he was a very learned man. So he goes into a city and everybody says, it was Yawmul Juma, Friday. So everybody says, Mullah Sahib, you know, look, leaders in the Azhar. I mean, we want you to lead us. We want you to deliver the khutbah and lead us in salat. He's very shy. He knows he can't make the grade. But they force him. He said, look, you man, such a nice big beard, lovely beard, lovely turban and lovely clothes. <laughs> so they forced him. The poor fellow goes on to the member and he says, do you know what I'm going to speak about? So they said, yes. Oh, I says, then I don't have to waste my time. <laughs> you know what I'm going to speak about, so why waste time? You know it. So he got himself, you know, recused. He, he freed himself. The following Friday, he's still in the town, so they catch him again. He says, mm, you must. So he goes on to the member again, Juma time, for the khutbah. And he's asking the same question. He says, do you know what I'm going to speak about? So they decided, they said, no, this guy, when he said last week, when he said, we know, he got scot free. So they said, no, no, we don't know. So they said, look, in that case, he says, no sense in talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. So the following week, the following week, they're still in the same city. You know? So they prod him again onto the member. And he poses the same question. You see, people don't learn. He's posing the same question. He said, do you know what I'm going to speak about? So they had decided, they said, look, man, this guy got off twice. This time we'll make doubly sure that we catch him. So he said, half of us must say yes, and half of us must say no. So they did it, exactly. Half said yes, half said no. So he said, look, those of you who know, tell the others who don't know. <laughs> and he got off again. <laughs> I don't think I have that chance. So, incest, it's a small word, but incest, you see, when you go about, you know, uh, gallivanting, and you go and interfere with somebody else's wife or daughter out of marriage, we call it zina, it's adultery, fornication, that you know. See, out of marriage, have any relationship with a woman, is zina, fornication. But if you did the very same thing with your mother, that's incest. If you did it with your daughter, that's incest. If you did it with your sister, is incest. If you did it with your daughter-in-law, is incest. 
and there are five cases of incest in this book of God in inverted commas. Book of God, I say, in inverted commas. I don't say it's a book of God. But there are five cases of incest in the first book of the Bible. As if it is a textbook on incest. You know, to tell you, now what, what types of incest can you commit? You know, you might not have the imagination. Sisters, you see, you can do it with your daughters, you can do it with your sister, you can do it with your mother, you can do it with your daughter-in-law. Five different cases of incest. In a book of God, God took the trouble of dictating to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, so can write about Lut, a brother in prophethood, Lut alayhi salam. After the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we are told in this first book that he goes and lives in a place, in a cave, in Zohar, with his two daughters. And night after night, the daughters make the father drink and seduce him and collect his seed. They collect the father's seed. It's a noble thought they had. You know, our father is old, and there is not another man on earth who can come into us in the manner of men. So he says, come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him so that we may preserve the seed of our father. Ignoble thought. What a thought. And they did it to the father. And the firstborn gave birth to a child called Moab. And the second one gave birth to a child called Ammon, from whom we get the Ammonites and the Moabites. And these were blessed by God. God blessed them. When the Jews were told to go and kill the Palestinians, the Philistines, God tells them, according to this holy book, go and kill them all, men, women, and children. Even sucklings are not to be spared. You know, little children sucking the mother's breast, even they are not to be spared. Wipe them out. And even donkeys were, said, even donkeys were slain. I said, what sins did the donkeys commit? What harm could they have done to you? On another occasion, the same God of mercy, according to the Bible, he's telling the Jews, the, repeats the same formula, go and kill them all, men, women, and children. Only virgins you must pay for yourself, which no man had known. And they, they got for themselves, out of the Palestinian woman, 30 and 2,000 virgins, which no man had known. And out of that, 30 and 2 was for the Lord, God, his share. Can you imagine God having a share in your virgins? I'm asking, what does he do with virgins? No, in the name of the Lord, the priest will enjoy them. Habis. And you say it's the book of God. God talking like that? Then you must go and find them out, which is virgin, which is, if she's not a virgin, kill her. Little children, of course, what? kill her, with a male or female, kill them. But if they're big enough, and you think they can come into use, verify, verify. How do you verify? Stop for Allah. Book of God? I says, no, this is not the book of God, nor is it the book of Moses. Why would he go and drop his brother prophet down to that level of committing incest with his own daughters? Then they tell you that Ibrahim alayhi salam committed incest with his sister. They say Sarah was his sister. Then they tell you that Reuben, one of the sons of Yaqub alayhi salam, he goes and cohabits with his mother on the roof. And he said, Israel was told. People told him, he said, look, your son was enjoying his mother on the roof. And he didn't even say, oof. He didn't even say, ah. He didn't even say, Ugh. nothing, nothing, not one word from him. Imagine, as he was very happy to hear the news. <coughs> then Judah, the father of the Jewish race, from whom we get the word Judea, from which whom we get the word Judaism, Huda, Yahuda, Yahudi, Judah. He goes and cohibits with his daughter-in-law by the roadside. He's going to Timnath to share his sheep. And he sees this woman sitting by the wayside, and he thinks she's a prostitute, a harlot. So he comes up to her, and he says, allow me to come. I'm only reading the Holy Bible. He says, allow me to come in unto thee. This is classical King James English, which, you know, not King James English. This, our Jimmy Swaggart, he takes oath by this. This is the best Bible that there is, and I'm quoting from there, his Bible, King James Version. It says, allow me to come in unto thee. So she says, what will thou give me? He said, I'll give you a kid from the flock, a goat kid. So what guarantee that thou will give it? Because after you enjoy and you're gone, maybe I'll never see you again. She says, what guarantee do you want? He said, your signet, means your ring and your bracelet. Maybe they used to wear those things those days. And your, your staff, you know, the rod, the rod of Moses, Asa. So the old man gave it to her, and he covered it with his daughter-in-law, and made her pregnant, and she bought twins. And these twins, Fares and Zara, are the great-grandfathers of Jesus Christ in the Holy Bible. 
First chapter of Matthew, first book of the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 1, it begins. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares and Zara of Tamar. Who are these? Look at Genesis chapter 38. It tells you he's a father-in-law, cohibiting with his daughter-in-law, and produces bastard children, children of incest, and they are the great grandfathers of the Christian God, Jesus Christ. A man who had no genealogy, they go and give him a genealogy, two genealogies. Between the two, they give him 66 fathers and grandfathers. A man who had no father, they give him 66 fathers and grandfathers. And God is not one of them. Can you imagine? He's the son of God, but he's not there in either genealogy. My son is here at the back. Imagine me dictating to you his genealogy. And I give to him, you know, from memory, 66 fathers and grandfathers. But I'm not one of them. <laughs> I'm not one of those 66. What am I telling you? What am I telling you? That he's a bastard 66 times over. No? What does it mean? I give you 66 fathers and grandfathers to my son, and, but I am not one of them. What am I saying? A man who had no father, they give him 66. And out of the 66, there are six bastards and bigoters of bastards, according to their own records. In the book of God, is this the book of God? I says, you know, I can go endlessly. The New Testament, it begins. Every book, new book, begins. Matthew. It says, the gospel according to St. Matthew. The gospel according to St. Mark. The gospel according to St. Luke. The gospel according to St. John. I'm asking, what is according, according, according? Why according to, according to, according to? I write little books as well, you know. But you'll find my name there, by Ahmad Didat. It's not according to Ahmad Didat. If you wrote it, Thinking that I had said or I meant such and such a thing, then you can say, according to Mr. D. Dutt, you know, this is his theory, or this is what he said. It might not be true. You might have misunderstood. But if I write a book, I put my name. Matthew didn't write his name. Mark didn't write his name. Luke didn't write his name. John didn't write his name. These are anonymous books. And you think, well, maybe, you know, this count can only come from Mr. Didat, so you put Didat's name. This can only come from Brother Farah Khan, so you put his name. This can only come from Brother Waris Muhammad, so you put his name. You have no right to do that. Nobody has a right to do that. You are doing injustice to the man. If he hadn't said that, you might not be quoting exact. So, according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to St. John. And internal evidence shows that all said that they didn't write the book. This is what you see from the outside, on the heading. They put, the Christians put the heading. So, in the internal evidence, you read Matthew 9.9. 9. I said Matthew 9.9, 9. but Matthew didn't write it. Why do I say that? Matthew 9.9, 9, when Matthew didn't write it. You see J.B. Phillips. J.B. Phillips, a prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral in England, a paid servant of the Anglican Church, he translated the Gospels into modern English, because the English that I'm quoting to you is a bit archaic, you know, old-fashioned, because I'm reading from the King James Version. A lot of people, they love it. They lack up that language of the King James Version, so I use it. I'm, I'm also used to it. But J.B. Phillips, in his preface to the Gospel of St. Matthew, he says, Early tradition ascribed this Gospel to the Apostle Matthew. Early tradition, that's what people said that this is the book of Matthew. Early tradition ascribed this gospel to the apostle Matthew. But scholars nowadays almost all reject this view. Hindu scholars? Muslim scholars? <coughs> Jewish scholars? No. Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they say, this is what they say, scholars nowadays almost all reject the view that Matthew wrote Matthew. The author, whom we may still conveniently call Matthew, which I'm doing, instead of telling you the first book of the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 1. Why am I wasting your time, my time? No, I say Matthew 9.9, 9, Matthew 5.17. Conveniently, I'm using the word Matthew. 
See, the author, whom we may still conveniently call Matthew, has plainly drawn on the mysterious Q. This Q, the letter Q, is also in inverted commas. But they're trying to say that Q stands for the German word Quella. Quella means sauces. Therefore, in, in, the, author, the scholars, they know what they're talking about. Then they say Q, which may have been a collection of oral traditions. He has used Mark's gospel freely. Who? Matthew has used Mark's gospel freely. In the language of the school teacher, he has been copying wholesale from Mark. And Mark was a 10-year-old boy when Jesus walked this earth. Matthew is supposed to be a disciple of Jesus, an eyewitness, and a ear witness. And he goes and copies a 10-year-old boy who wasn't there. And you say, this is the book of Matthew. Poor Matthew. What kind of, what kind of mind did he have? What kind of eyes or ears did he have? that he goes and copies somebody else when he was an eyewitness and your witness. Now we know Matthew didn't write Matthew. This is it. You, know, you don't have to be very clever. You don't have to be a DD or a DDAC to know these things. <laughs> a little, just a little observation. And you can see through and through. You can deal with swagats and the likes of him anytime, any day. Allah has given us that destiny. But we don't do homework. See, we listen and we enjoy and say, right, we go home and go to sleep. You have to do a little bit of homework. See, in other words, now you see this, it's right, look, let me check up, let me see something. And you see the verse, huh? says, Matthew 9, 9, I told you, open it up, Matthew 9, 9, what does it say? It says, while he, referring to Jesus, was going forth into the way, see, this is old English, King James English, while he was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, saw a tax collector called Matthew. And he, Jesus, came up to him, Matthew, and told him, Matthew, follow me, Jesus. And he, Matthew, followed him, Jesus. I'm asking, did Matthew write that? Or Jesus write that? Who wrote it? Can't you see? This is, these are not the words of Matthew. These are not the words of God. And these are not the words of Jesus. This is not the Injil. We believe in the Injil. What is the Injil? I say, Injil is the revelation, the Wahi, that Allah gave Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. And the Bible tells us, this Bible, it tells us, Matthew tells us, that Jesus went to a certain place and he preached the gospel. In Arabic, Injil. Gospel means the good news. Translated into Arabic, Injil. He went and preached the Injil. Mark says he went to a certain other place and he preached the Injil. Gospel. Luke tells us that he went to a certain place and he preached the Injil gospel, Injil. And John tells us that Jesus went to a certain other place and he preached the gospel, Injil. I'm asking, did he carry a book around under his arm, under his arm? Did he? Injil? That he, every time he took it out? Isn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Is that what he was doing? No. Whatever revelation Wahi Allah gave him, that is the Injil. Now they tell you, the Christians themselves, you don't have to do any homework with regards to the Bible. You don't have to make any new discoveries. Whatever they gave you, learn from them and use it. They tell you now, they translate the Bible, the New Testament, into Arabic. They have for the Arabs 11 different Arabic Bibles. I have samples of that. 11 different. I thought there was only one Arabic language. But I'm now told that there are 11 different dialects. And every dialect group is says, look, we got it for you. You are Palestinian, we got it for you. What are you? Moroccan, we got it for you. Tunisian, we got it for you. Southern Sudan, we got it for you. What are you? Syrian, we got it for you. 11 different Bibles for the Arabs alone. In Arabic, different dialects. So they feel that you have no excuse for rejecting the blood of Christ. 11 different Bibles making it easy for you. Let's do So. The Arabic translation, the book begins, it says, Injile Matthew, Injile Marcus, Injile Lucas, Injile Yohanna. It's right, right, we accept you say Injile, Matthew, Marcus, Lucas, Johanna, okay. I said, where is Injile Isa? <laughs> Look, we believe, what did we say? We say we believe in the Injil. When we say Injil, it is a revelation, the Wahi given to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. That is what we believe. Not one given, to, if at all. If given to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who are they? Who is Paul, Peter, and James? Who are they? We are made to accept that is the Wahi Allah gave to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. 
Injile Isa. Bring it. And we will give it a sympathetic consideration. If it is from Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. But these are not the works of Isa alayhi salam. Can you see? Look, they are telling you. Why must you go out of your way and say, this is the Torah, this is the Injil, this is the Zabur, and you get caught up with it? No, it's lack of knowledge. Now, all this information is available very freely. In a book called, Is the Bible God's Word? Published by me, we give it out free. I sent out 10,000 to your great country from, from South Africa, airlifted them. 10,000 is the Bible God's word, uh, 5,000 crucifixion of crucifixion, and thousands of other pamphlets and literature. I airlifted it from South Africa, costing me more than 20,000 rand in postage. That's to me, my rand is worth more than a dollar in my country. On the commercial market, it's worth about 50 cents. But internally, that rand is worth more to me. I can get more for my rand than you can get for your $2 here. My rand is worth more in my country than your two dollars are worth here. If you buy some tea and cakes here, what your two dollars can't bring, my rand brings it for me on the other side. I spent 20, more than 20,000 rand posted. Now your government has got it all. This is now look, uh, you know, there's some great sanctions has been introduced against my country. Deservedly, they deserve it. But now I said, look, this has got nothing to do with this. You know, we are not doing business. We're not trying to sell something to you. We're going to give it out free of charge. But now there's a problem there. We wanted these books to be there, available at Baton Rouge. Give it to the people. Let them take them home. You know, a permanent record of what I said and more, more than what I'm saying, because I can't say in 50 minutes, 60 minutes, you know, what I can say in a book. But that book is available to you, absolutely free of charge. You must find out, you know, Brother uh, Hamid Ghazali, you know, he will be handling the books. But I know our people, you know, we have developed a type of mentality of get, get, get. We haven't learned to give. I said, look, you're killing them, eh? They have been killing me. Arabs have been killing me. Wallah, the Arabs. This asks for my free literature. When I say free, I give them free. But with that, I sent a note. I said, look, the literature is free, as promised. But please consider the postage. I said, you see the postage stamps on the cover of the envelope? It says five rands and 50 cents. It means five dollars and 50 cents. At one time, my dollar was worth more than, the, uh, my rand was worth more than your dollar. So I said, look, five rands means five dollars. So if you will consider, mm -hmm. they ask for all the other literature, but no mention of postage. No, it, it's a habit, it's a habit. Not that they are misers, they're helping me, alhamdulillah. But the generality of people, we haven't learned to give. The Christian gives, gives, gives. That's what makes Jimmy Swaggart what he is. Yes. In his book on Roman Catholicism, he's saying that he is now appearing, that when he wrote the book, on over 700 commercial TV stations. If I tell my people, I say, what? You know, we've got only one station in the whole of South Africa. And this guy's talking about 700. And there's thousands of cable channels. So what is all that? And he is, he says he needs $291,000 a day to keep his head above water, that he doesn't drown, he doesn't go insolvent. $291,000 a day. I got a calculator and I worked it out, 106 million a year not to go insolvent. Then I'm just reading a book while I'm on my way from, um, from Dubai. His magazine called Evangelist. And now he's talking about, he says he wants a million dollars a day. And he'll get it. No, no, no. They, they, there's something about these people, you know, when they, the people, when they go off, they go off. <laughs> but those that are there, you know, they give not only their 10% tithes out of their wages, out of their income, 10%. We can't give two and a half. One fortieth we can't give. You know that? The Muslims can't give two and a half percent. If we only gave two and a half percent, man, we have no problems in the world. We can't give two and a half. That guy's giving 10%. If he's earning $1,000 a month, $100 goes to the church first. First, 100 goes to 1,200 a year. I'm asking which milking cow can give you that without you feeding it? The Christian cow. He gives you 1,200 a year. You don't have to feed it. And when they go into the lecture, I'm, I'm seeing his tapes. He says the offerings that they made. He said, look, because I'm saying such and such a thing, don't take your offerings back. In other words, they have to make an offering before coming in. They don't send those plates around anymore, the buckets. Last time I came along in Chicago, in the mosque there. You know. uh, uh, they used to send buckets around, no buckets, plastic buckets. And people put in their 
one dollar note, five dollar note, Alhamdulillah, they were paying through their noses for the Islam. Yes, they paid for it, they appreciate it. We get it for nothing, everything. In my country, hot and cold water, uh, you know, air conditioning, uh, air, beautiful carpets, everything free. So we create that mentality, beggary mentality. You want to, can you give me something? That beggary. You are a millionaire, but are, you are still, the beggar's mentality is still there. It's not leaving you. The Christian says, pray for me. <laughs> you know when he says, pray for me, you know what he's telling you? Give me money. <laughs> they understand. If I told you, pray for me, ah, he said, may Allah give you a long life, you know, may you live to a hundred. I said, drag my feet, you want me to drag my feet? Hundred. Yeah, this is, you know, may Allah give you health, strength, and may you live to a hundred. Hmm. <laughs> That's our prayer. It's prayer, empty. However, I said, the Quran and the Bible, which is God's word. I have taken, I think, more than sufficient time for the Bible. And uh, you get that book and you'll see, it is not the book of God. The word of God is there, it is there. Allah's kalam is there in the Bible. We can't say it's not there. Good words, good teachings are there. Word of the prophet is there. Word of the historian is there. And there are other things besides which no decent man can read to his sister, mother, daughter, or even his fiance if she's a good woman. <laughs> oh, shall I give you examples of that? You see, the word of God. I said the word of God is there. The Bible as a book, as a whole, per se, is not the book of God. Right? But the word of God is there. We can't say everything is rubbish. Everything is to be thrown away. No, no, we can't say. We are doing injustice to the book. The word of God, like in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18, you read there, and you can, as it sounds, as if God Almighty is talking to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, he says, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Who is this I? You don't have to be a doctor of divinity to recognize that this I is God Almighty, talking to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren like unto thee, means like you, like Musa. And I, God Almighty, will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. This is from the Arabic Bible. So in other words, we can recognize as if God is talking. No hesitation in it. recognizing it. Or another example of the same type. In the book of Isaiah, God says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Now, these words were uttered by the prophet Isaiah. But we can read, and the Jews knew that he was not claiming divinity, that I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. No. When he did that, he was only quoting God's words. He was acting as a mouthpiece of God. We recognize that these are the words of God. That's one type of evidence. The other type of evidence, a prophet of God talking in the New Testament, I give you examples. It says, Jesus says, it has been said by them of old time. Time's gone by. It has been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, but I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. Who's talking? A prophet of God. I is Jesus. He says again, another place. He says, it has been said by them of old time that whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. But I say unto you, who is this I? Jesus. He quotes again, another place. See, it has been said by them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil. He who strikes you on the right cheek, give him the other. Who says I? Jesus. Words of a prophet of God. We saw the words of God. Now we see the words of a prophet of God. Third type of evidence from the Gospel of St. Mark. It says, while he, Jesus, was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, saw a fig tree with leaves. He, Jesus, happily came up to it, wanting to find figs thereon. But when he came up to it, he found nothing but he found nothing but leaves, for the season was not yet. Who's talking? 
not God, not Jesus, but an eyewitness or a ear witness or somebody speaking from hearsay, what he had heard. Can you see? Third type, third type of evidence. Word of God, word of the prophet, word of the historian, an eyewitness or ear witness or somebody writing from hearsay. Fourth type. The fourth type, I, I dare not quote it. My government banned it in the country, South Africa. My own government banned this in the country in South Africa. I think that I have. I have, you see, a reproduction from the Holy Bible, a chapter. And from this chapter, you'll find that certain writings are in red. Red. Those writings in red are nine extracts. Somebody had published it, the word of God, in inverted commas for free distribution. And this, somebody drew the censor board's attention to it. And the South African censorship board, they banned the pamphlet, not knowing that these are extracts from the Holy Bible in inverted commas. They banned it. This same government of mine is very strict, very stringent, unlike your Christian nation here. You see, in South Africa, if I buy some of the books, I can buy at Kennedy Airport or from Heathrow. If I go into the country, I go to jail for two years with your playboy. If I go with him, I go to jail for two years. That's how staunch my Christian white government is as far as religiosity is concerned. So, seeing this, and on the board there were two priests, and even they couldn't recognize that this is the word of God. They banned it. I said, on that basis, you see, on the basis that Oh, for one word, there was one undesirable word in a book called Lady Chatterley's Lover, a novel. One word, a four-letter word, one word. For that, they banned the book for 20 years in my country. 20 years, that book was banned. Now they have unbanned it. They've become a little more broad-minded. See, day by day, pornography. You keep on seeing this soft porn, then come hard porn, and then it becomes, I don't know what other degrees. You see, it keeps on escalating. So, likewise, for one word, they banned the book for 20 years. Now they're broad-minded. They say, look, that book is now passed. You can read it. You see, now you have grown, mature now. You can read it. But still, these nine extracts from the Holy Bible, banned. So I said, if you can book a ban, a book for one word, nine extracts, why shouldn't you ban another book? Nine extracts. But how can he? How can they? They take oath by this. You see, when you go to the court, they take oath by this. It makes the non-Muslim also to take oath by this. Put your hand and say, I'll speak the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. So everybody has to put his hands on the book. How can you ban the book? But it is so filthy. It is so dirty that I would only say, my dear brothers and sisters, if you have the guts, the courage, but I think you people have the guts and the courage. You know, as soon as you switch on your TV, somewhere along the line, you'll see things there that you'll have to change quickly, you see. He says, no, man, this is undesirable. You will have to censor it yourself. Your TV, your TV, 24 hours a day. You just try and get some station, and you get something else. So, put it on. So you people are used to, you're used to. Read it. Read it. Book of Ezekiel. Chapter 23, the whoredoms of those two sisters, you know, what they did and how and her paramours, you know, her lovers, you know, what type of lovers she had, you read it for yourself. No decent man can read it to his mother, sister, or daughter, or even to his fiancée if she's a good woman. Book of God, God speaking words which you are ashamed to utter. Can you imagine? If I tell you, suppose I was a Christian, I said, uncle, I want you to read Ezekiel chapter 23. You know, I want, for the edification of these people here, I want you to read it. And I said, no, 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 I can't read it here. So well, what's wrong, uncle? I said, no, it's too horrible. But it's the word of God. If God was not ashamed to utter those words and expressions and those descriptions, why should I be ashamed? Am I holier than God? Can you be holier than God? If God was not ashamed, why should you be ashamed? You are ashamed because you know in your heart of heart this is not the word of God. Alhamdulillah. In Islam, we also have those four types of literature. We have. But our literature is in four different compartments. See, we have the word of God in the Quran, Allah's kalam. We have the words of the Prophet 
separate book. Hadith. We have the words of our historian, Imam Ghazali, Ibn Rushd, and so on, Avasina, separate books. We have our Arabian Nights. Yes. <laughs> the Arabs around the campfire in the desert before Islam, he had it. How did he pass his time? These filthy, dirty stories. I read it, the unexpurgated edition of the Arabian Nights by Fitzgerald when I was young. I read it and I loved it. I enjoyed it and reread it again and again. <laughs> At that time, I didn't know that I could have bought a two and six, 25 cent Holy Bible. <laughs> 25 cents then it was. And I could have got everything that I was looking for here, but I was hunting everywhere else. <laughs> Expensive books. So we have the Book of God, separate, the words of the Prophet, separate, the words of the historian, separate, and our Arabian night, separate. And we do not treat them on equal level. We don't. Nobody does. No Muslim will say the Quran, the Hadith is equal to the Quran. Or uh, the, our historian, Imam Ghazali, you know, his writing are equal to Hadith. No, nobody does. Or our Arabian night is equal to Imam Ghazali. Nobody says that. They are all on different, different levels. And separate, separate compartments. The Bible, unfortunately, everything is in one book. The book of God is there, the book of the prophet is there, the book of the historian is there, and pornography is there. All in one book. And he doesn't know how to take things out, how to separate it. He can't. He can't now say, take this out and throw it away. He can't. There are millions and millions of Bible in the world. It is the world's bestseller. It is. So, this is the Bible. You have to know something about it. You're living in an environment of the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. You must know about the Bible. It will make your task easy to deal with people, to discuss with people, to attract people. The Quran, need I prove it to you? I know the answer is not necessary, but I'll give you a few examples. This book, purely on its human level, its contents on the human level, we're not talking about whether it's Allah's kalam or not, just on the human level. If Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if he wrote this book, if he wrote this book, let's accept it for a moment, the enemies charge that Muhammad wrote the book. So all right, he wrote the book. I said, this book written by Muhammad? He said, yes. I said, you know, there are 40 different authors put together wrote this book, 40. 40, 40, the Bible of the 66 books written by 40 different persons put together, produce this book, this one man job. Come on now, tell me now. How can you compare? Can you compare one man job? 40 people had to do this. On the human level, I said it outclasses everything that you got. And besides, this one book gives you answers to all your problems. All your problems are answered here. Here, the 66 books, you haven't got the answers yet. You are fumbling. You don't know what to do with your alcoholics. You can write very strongly. Jimmy Swaggart, he wrote a book on alcohol. This is a, a great curse in America, a major problem of America. And he gives figures. You know, this is statistics. He must have got it from the experts. He says there are 11 million drunkards in America. 11 million. Right, that's your figure. 11 million. And 44 million heavy drinkers. Drunkards are people who can't control themselves. The others are heavy drinkers. They're almost close by. And he says, and we have to agree with him, he said, I see no difference between the two, between the drunkards and the heavy drinkers. He says, I don't see any difference. It means 55 million drunkards, according to Jimmy Swaggart. I said, one step further. Come with us a step further in Islam. Your social drinkers as well. Include them into your list. Because the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he said, whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. No excuse for a nip or a tot. <laughs> Include them as well. So you have more than 100 million drinkers. Answer to the problem, only Islam has. What does it say? One verse. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya yuhal lazina amanu, so uju kubiti. Innam al-khamru, so most certainly intoxicants, wal maisiru and gambling, wal ansabu and fortune telling, wal aslamu and idol worship, ritsu minam al-shaytan, are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Fajtani buhu la'allakum tuflihun. It's a shan such abomination that he may prosper. 
the safety lies in abstinence. And the only religion on the face of the earth which says don't touch that devilish stuff is Islam. There's not another religion on earth. There's not another religious book on earth which says don't touch it. Don't go anywhere near it. The Christian missionaries, and he's complaining about them. He himself, a preacher, evangelist, is complaining about other preachers, other evangelists. He said, they can't take up a stand against alcohol. He said, at the conference of evangelists, he said, people were asked, how many of you are prepared You take a stand against alcohol? Please stand up. And he says, hardly anybody stood up. Because they say, and they reason, the preacher, the born again, he's got a new spirit into him, he says. You know, the spirit dwells in him. He's got the spirit of God in him. You know, he can sin no more. These sinless people, you know, they say, justify drink by saying that Jesus Christ turned water into wine at the marriage feast at Cana. If it is good enough for our God, it's good enough for us. That's the logic. And they're logical. And they say that this is the same W-I-N-E wine which Lot drank and prohibited with his daughters. Same W-I-N-E wine in Greek. This and that. He says, look, if Christ would turn water into wine, he is not a killjoy. Why should we be killjoys? <laughs> look, the logic is good. Now, the reason is because you haven't got it. And the reason you haven't got it is, Jesus Christ, before he parted, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. I have many things to tell you, but you can't bear it. You haven't got the capacity. You are like little children. And the truth of this statement is writ large in the New Testament. Again and again, Jesus speaks about his disciples. He tells them, ye of little faith, ye of little faith. You've got no faith, be iman, without faith. How many times? Dozens of times. And he explains to them as if he's explaining to little children. And they can't understand. So he said, are you even yet without understanding? Yet? What's wrong with you? And when he's provoked further, he says, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? I say, if Jesus was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed that honorable harakiri, suicide. <laughs> Look this. Everything he says, they misunderstand. Everything. And everything he has said his, his followers, disciples of today, they misinterpret. Everything, without exception. I can give you examples. So Jesus says, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you to all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. So who is the spirit of truth? So the Christian says, the Holy Ghost. Who's got it? Everyone. Every church. In my country, there are a thousand different churches and denominations among the whites of South Africa, and 3,000 among the blacks. This morning I had a confirmation that you have 40 different Baptist churches in America. Different. One won't go to the other Baptist church. But me, I don't have music in the church. You have. You, he has music, but he, he doesn't allow dancing and on. 40 different Baptist churches in America. I don't know altogether how many sects. And I'm discovering new, new names, which I didn't know before. Cults, new, new cults. Jesus only is a new cult. You know, I know this from Jimmy Swaggart's book. I didn't know that there was a Jesus only. That means the Father is Jesus, the Holy Ghost is Jesus, and Jesus is Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's a Jesus only cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have people in your mix. You have funny, funny things here. You know? <laughs> America is right for anything. America is ready. Wallah, it's ready for anything. You see, look, Sun Myung Moon, the Korean. You know, he comes here and he says he is Jesus Christ in the second coming. And there are people prepared to worship him. They're worshiping. Then, uh, there was a, uh, one of our blacks, you know, Father Divine. He's dead now. This Father Divine, he claimed to be God. And the Caucasian, the white man worshipped him, and the black man worshipped him, and everybody worshipped him. You got to make the claim. Swami Parvupada, who, uh, uh, who started this Hare Krishna movement, the people worshipped him as God. Guru Maharajji, the man who never gets old, he's only 16. You know, they're worshipping him as God. Maharishi, they worship him. There is a Satan worshipping cult. I say, anything goes. I want to know why Islam won't go. No, it won't go because you are not opening your mouth. You don't, you get inferiority complexes. Beyond measure, wallah, the amount of inferiority complexes. My Muslim brother suffer here, I don't know today, but in 1977, nine years ago I came here. And I was traveling, they made me to travel from city to city. Every night a new bed, new town. 
So we phoned from here to Indianapolis. He said, look, d Dad is coming, and he is prepared to lecture to you on a certain night and advertise the subject, what the Bible says about Muhammad. This is a good starter, you know, to giving people a background how to get started, what the Bible says about Muhammad. When I arrive in Indianapolis, they're taking me to the lecture room. I say, what have you done? What have you advertised? They say, no, we had some pamphlets, what you call stickers, or what you call them, leaflets taken out, flyers, what do you call them? taken out. I says, can I have a look? So they give it to me, and I read. It says, a prophet in the Bible. I said, a prophet in the Bible? What does a prophet mean? And you are university students. You fools, what is a prophet? A means any. Do you know that? Not the, if there's a the prophet, they say, what, which one are you talking about? They might question you. But it's a prophet in the Bible. 75 are mentioned. Which one are you interested in? I ask you. Huh? Are you going to have a department store in a supermarket and you want to buy, see, what do you come for? I want to buy a thing. <laughs> what a thing? What do you want? It's a thing. Huh? Will they serve you? So this is a lunatic. You know, what you wasting on? You're going to buy a thing. It's, a, it's hard to imagine the inferiority complexes that you people suffer from. No Muslims. I, I exclude my black brothers out of that. I'm talking about my people from the East. You know, Arabs and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, I'm talking about them. Here, I take off my hat to my African brother. The, the After 300 years of hammering, these people, they have become one of the most militant Muslim communities in the world. And that was my boast. My people, in, uh, not my race, because I come from Indo-Pakistan subcontinent. We are a softer people than these brothers of mine that we call the Malays. I said, they are the most militant Muslim community in the world. Until I reached Chicago, I had to say, the, I'm sorry, I have to withdraw that now, but I was talking previously. The most militant Muslim community in the world is the black Muslim of South of America. I said, I said, we would, don't mind. I'm not ashamed to say we will come close second. <laughs> but the inferiority complexes. I go to Chicago. I'm sorry. Yeah. I go to Washington, D.C. And we have a great debate between Father Gabriel Duffy, the head of the Roman Catholic Church in inter-church relationship, and Ahmad Didad from across the Atlantic. How many people turned up? Just guess, how many? How many? How many? Thousand. Twenty. Not thousand. Twenty. One score. And most of them were women and children. Your niya, according to your niya, you get the barakah. Your blessings come according to your niya. Your niya is, you know, like a woman, you know. You, you are afraid to say Bible Muhammad. You are afraid. So you get, you get the results you are getting. You, know, you are terrified. You know why you are terrified? I discovered it. Why are you terrified? These Muslims from the Far East, my people. Why are they terrified? They are expatriates. They came here to study. And now after study, they say, man, opportunity is great here. You know, we can make money here. And life is more comfortable than going back to India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, or to the Arab countries. He says, now look, I opt to live here. So he says, now look, I make an application for domicile. They said they give you, uh, what do you call it, for five years on probation. And now, he says, now, if I say one thing that the, the, the people, the CIA or FBI won't like, he said they won't accept me. That is your mentality. You have sold your faith for a mess of pottage. That, now that continues. You got your, your, your paper. You know, they can't kick you out now. But still, you are terrified. That psychology keeps with you. Inferiority complex. I says, get it out of you. And the only thing that can make you do that is take up the Quran. Allah, read the Quran with understanding. And wallah, if you read it with understanding, you can't sit on your backside doing nothing. When Allah tells you, he says, he says, he it is who has sent his messenger with guidance, al-haq, and with the religion of truth, that it may prevail, overcome, and supersede every other deen, every other way of life. Never mind how much the unbeliever might not like it. Then he repeats the same formula, and he ends by saying, Never mind how, how much the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. Then he repeats the same formula, another place, three times in the Quran. 
هو الذي ارسل رسوله بالهدى هي دي از ويس سنت از مسنجر وذ جايدنس ودين الحق ان وذ ريليجن اوف ثروت ليزهره ولا الدين كله ذات ات مي بريفيل اوفر كم ان سوبرسيد افري اذر دين ويذر ات بي هندويزم بوديزم كريستيانيزم كوميونيزم جودايزم افري ايزم اسلام از ديستن تو ماستر ذم اول بولدوز ذم اول وكفى بالله شهيدا وكفى بالله شهيدا الله سيز ان اف از الله از ا ويتنس تو ذس فاكت that is going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you he can do it but he wants to give you and me that privilege the rotters that we are the rubbish that we are he wants you and me to earn a profit reward he wants us to do a profit job and earn a profit reward you can't become profit anymore our nabi karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the last and final messenger of god anybody after that tells you he has been hearing voices he needs a psychiatrist <laughs> but the work that allah has given bestowed upon us the honor the privilege is given to us is the work of the prophets of god and if you do a prophet's job you must earn a prophet's reward unless allah is unjust he makes you do the work of regan and he pays you for a sweeper's wage men men do that but not allah you do a prophet's job you earn a prophet's reward it's a privilege allah has given us i say my dear brothers and sisters take it up Take the Quran in one hand and the Bible in the other. Here you need it. You need them both, the Quran and the Bible, so you can catch fish. The other guy knows how to catch fish. He knows how to bait you. So you have to use that bait to say, "Now look, wait a minute. Now let us see. Let us examine." And this is what Allah tells you: "This kul ha tu burhan." Anything they come with, He says, "Tell them where is your proof? Where is your burhan? Let us have a look." In other words, you analyze it and you present your case. With these words, Mr. Chairman and brethren, you know, in this heat. I think I have taken quite a lot of your time, and uh, of course, at question time, I'm still I will still be at your disposal. Any questions on the subject or off the subject, it doesn't matter. But don't ask me questions in matters of Sharia. You go to your learned men. I am an expert in comparative religion, and in that field, you make me happy when you ask me questions because now you have the answer. You know, I shine. You ask me other questions, and I have to apologize. Okay, this guy knows nothing. So don't embarrass me in front of my sisters. Wa akhir da'wan an alhamdulillah. First of all, I would like to thank our brother Ahmed for enlightening us on the comparative aspects of the Quran and Bible. I apologize for the limited space uh, and for the heat also in this building, but uh, hopefully this increase our heat of the uh, We are going to offer our Asr prayer very shortly, and after Asr we'll meet again for the questions. So we will entertain questions. Uh, if you have questions, please make them short and, if possible, uh, to the topic that we have uh, addressed. And also, as our brother has mentioned, nothing on Islamic jurisprudence. I'll take my brother here. Um, I know that you're going to pay uh, Mr. Swag uh, this Monday. One of the things that he uses as sort of a storehouse for his faith and other evangelists, the subject of Israel, they claim that the Bible gives them the right to uh, exalt Israel, even though they did not accept their prophet. What do they use to base their uh, love of Israel on? In the Bible, they seem to find. You see, these Jews, our cousins, they are our cousins. To me, the Arabs are my brothers and the Jews are my cousins. You see, Allah has given them a little extra gray matter, not in size but in quality. Look, in the Quran, when Allah Bari Taala gives the good news about the birth of Ismail alayhi salam, Allah tells Ibrahim alayhi salam that I give you a son, Ghulaman Halima, a son who is humble, submissive, obedient. When he gives Again, the news about the birth of Ishaq alayhi salam, the progenitor of the Jewish race. He says, I will give you a son, good news of a son who is ghulam and alima, knowledgeable fellow, intelligent fellow. Look, Allah Baratara doesn't choose just words like that, you know, to, he wants to rhyme, halima, alima, he doesn't do things like that. When he says halima, there's something there in the Arab. That quality is there. 
There, he says, there's something else he's given him. Allah gives everybody something. Something unique. Everybody is unique, and every nation has got certain unique qualities. Every nation. Allah gives to everybody something. He gives you something, he gives me something else, you see. So now, the fellow with his brains, he programmed, he brainwashed the whole Christian world into believing and accepting that God Almighty had promised, promised Palestine to them. And their title deed is the Bible. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, it says God Almighty spoke to Abraham and he said, I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be the God. This is the title deed of the Jews to Palestine. Now, the Christian world, they know that the wrongs that they're doing to the Palestinians. They know, they feel it. They also have a conscience. But they say, look, at this is what God wants. How can I go against the will of God? If God gave you a title deed to a certain place, I don't like it. But I have to see to it, if God wants me to do that, I have to supplement it, whether I like it or not. This is how the Christian mentality is working. We have to reprogram the Christian. And we haven't started yet. This is the trouble with the Muslim. All right, I said my, to my Palestinian brother, if there are any here, I said, look, my brothers, I will not teach you how to fight the Jews. You know better than I. But we must open a second front. You see, during the World War II, Russia was crying, second front, second front. You know, the whole burden of the German might was on Russia. So it's a second front. Take the burden off as a little man. Take off a little burden, you know, pressure from us. I said, our second front is not with the gun. That you carry on what you are doing. I won't teach you what to do and how. But second front, intellectually, intellectual battle. This is his title deed. Allah says, Kul hatu burhanakum. Produce your evidence. He produced it. Here's my title deed. Now you must be in a position to examine it, which you are not capable. You don't know. You just say false, not right. But he's still got it under his arm. How can you take it away from him? So you have to now find out ways and means of reprogramming him. Unless you do that, you're going to keep on paying the price. And the whole Christian world will be supporting them because they are brainwashed. So the answer is, my dear brothers, brother, is that we have to learn how to do the job. Of course, this is not the occasion for me to deliver a lecture on that theme because it will take another hour and a half. See, and it's not fair to me or to the people that have gathered here. So next question. There was one here, and then I'll come to you. Yes, brother. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you about the previous debate that we saw with Dr. Shah. And also, uh, that was Yusuf Bakis. And uh, other journalist picture was right there. I don't remember his name. The end of the debate was almost the same thing. It didn't change. It was when they asked him, the Muslim asked him in London, uh, if Jesus was is really Jesus, the Son of God, and he couldn't answer. And the second question, I think I remember, Mr. Bacchus, they said Jesus went a little further down and he prayed. Did he pray to God? And he couldn't answer. Uh, the uh, Mr. Uh, Swigner, Jimmy Swigner? Swigner. Swigner. I think he might do, you know, he might just, if you put up the floor, he might do the same, the same way. So is there anything, you know, to, to prepare for this or I don't know? Yes. Uh, I think the question you have in mind is what is the benefit? Right, right, right. Three hours right. later, he right, 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 right. But now, suppose you were there. You saw the tape. Did it do anything to you? No, really. Nothing to you? To me? Yes. Well, if I was a Christian, probably. No, no. I'm asking you as a Muslim. If you saw that debate, you heard what was said. Overall, now, did anything happen to you? Was your spirit boosted? Did your morale, did it rise? As a Muslim, I was happy. Right, right. So that's the answer. Number one is, he said, look, man, we got it. This is summum bukun umyun fahum layer jiun. Allah is telling you, deaf and, but among them also, there are good people. You can't say they're all deaf, dumb, and blind. Allah tells you, min humul mu'minuna. Among them, there are mu'mins, good people. Wa aksar humul fasikun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. Here it is. The answer is given to you in the Quran. It's boosting your morale. The Muslim's morale, he says, no, man, we got it. This old man, if he can do it, why can't we? You see? Or if somebody gives you a bashing, he says, you know, if my uncle did that was here, you know, he would have knocked else into the fellow. If you can think that much, you have saved yourself. Can you see? Is that something for you? If it didn't, then the, all of you are wasting time. All of you. You know, if you're here, 
You know, he said, look, what does he do? You know, we are still the same. I said, look, if he did nothing for you, you are wasting time and I'm also wasting my time. I don't think so. Otherwise, I wouldn't have come here. I know there are good people among them and there are our own people who are on the fence. People are under pressure, under attack. If that can help you, he says, no, man. You see, the trouble with us is we don't know his book. We don't know what he's carrying. If you only knew, you know, this thing wouldn't happen to us. We wouldn't lose our children. We are losing them. See, in, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, they have perverted more Pakistanis since independence than in the previous 100 years of British rule. More Bangladeshis to, into Christianity than the previous 100 years of British rule. They have perverted 15 million Indonesians into Christianity. So I said, now look, you don't know how to fight back. So if you buy that exercise, if the people that were there ask them, I see, UK has changed. The attitude has changed. The younger man now, he's looking for customers in my country. See, immediately after the meeting, there are groups and groups and groups. What are they doing? They're catching somebody, said, look, and they start uh, debating with the fellow. And groups and groups. I said, he's doing the job. See, he's creating all other little, little didats. I said, right, alhamdulillah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to create a firqa or a, or a, or a cult around didat, no. I, I, I'm a Muslim. I hope Allah accepts me as a Muslim, and I die as a Muslim. And, you know, you make dua for me. <laughs> so there I don't need money, you see. <laughs> so, no. The thing is this now, his success with Jimmy Swaggart. You see, this guy is on a world standard. He is a heavyweight champion of the world, the greatest evangelist of the day. I heard him. I, I showed this poster to Dr. Sheikh Sultan uh, Al Qasimi of Sharjah. I showed him this. So I'm going to America to meet this man. So he says, This guy is big shaitan. <laughs> So I'm asking him, how do you know? You know, you people in the Middle East, you know, away from the active, all the action. What do you know about this big shaitan? He said, no, I was in America, and I was, you know, fiddling with that uh, TV, and the guy came on. And he says, believe me, Mr. Didat, you can't put it off. Even if he's swearing your mother, you say, you've got to listen to him. You feel like breaking the screen, but you can't put it off. <laughs> so right, alhamdulillah, some little children, our little children, you know, from the university, our little children, they were fishing, you know, to get him involved. And they succeeded, you see? It's Allah's way, Allah's way. Right, what comes out of it? I said, look, you are the listener, you are the hearer. Among his audience also, there'll be people, all can be zombies, you know? Oh, everyone is not a zombie. You can bluff some of the people some of the time, but you can't bluff all the people all the time. So if a half a dozen, a quarter dozen, if their iman is strengthened, if some quarter dozen can come to the right path by listening to this debate and all of the way, if you can boost your morale, I said the job is done. This is the purpose of the exercise. Any questions from the sisters? Yes, brother, then I'll take you. No, not you, yeah. The, the brother behind you, I'm sorry. He asked first. Just uh, Concerning the character. Oh, the comforter in the uh, New Testament. Uh, we understand that Jesus, a lay Islam, prophesied the coming of one after them, who uh, the Christians have uh, translated the word character, as you know, as comforter. Uh, they also claim that in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, that this incident that occurred on the day of Pentecost was, in fact, the uh, comforter uh, that was awaited. Can you explain something concerning that? Also, St. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. Really I think question. it's a very tall order you have given now. After such a long time speaking on a subject, over the first portion, I will deal with that. You see, the Comforter. They say that the Comforter is the Holy Ghost. All right. We say, look, this coming of the Comforter, in this verse, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. The coming of the Comforter is conditional on him going away. But if the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, we see in their own scripture, their own book, that his coming, the Holy Ghost, the coming of the Holy Ghost was not conditional. Because Luke chapter 1 tells us that Elizabeth had the Holy Ghost. That's long before Jesus was born. Then the same book, chapter 1, Luke tells us that John the Baptist had the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Jesus was not born. Then Jesus Christ 
they tell us that he healed with the help of the Holy Ghost. His disciples went on the preaching and healing with the help of the Holy Ghost. They preached and they healed. Before Jesus parted, he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive, yeah, take it. So was he bluffing or did he give it to them, that gift? The answer should be that he did. He wasn't bluffing them. Right. So in other words, the coming or going of the Holy Ghost was not conditional, but the coming of the Comforter is conditional. Then this word Comforter. You see, this word Comforter is English. Did Jesus say that in English? He says, no. Then I'm reading this in Arabic. In Arabic, the same verse in Arabic. It's a lakinni akulu lakum al إِنَّهُ خَيْرًا لَكُمْ إِنْ أَنْتَلِكَ لِأَلَّهُ إِلَّا مَنْ تَلِكْ لَا يَاتِيكُمُ الْمُؤَزِّ وَلَكِنْ إِنْ زَهَبْتُ أُرْسِلْهُ إِلَيْكُمْ In Arabic Bible, it says مُؤَزِّ I said, did Jesus speak Arabic? They said, no. I said, what did he say? In the Zulu Bible, it says, مُتَوَزِّ I said, did he speak Zulu? They said, no. In the African Bible, it says, Truasta. I said, did he speak Afrikaans? They said, no. In 2,000 different languages, there are 2,000 different names. What did he say? The Quran tells us, Kawais Kala Isa ibn Maryama, behold, Jesus the son of Mary said, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, inni Rasulullah ilaykum. Most certainly I'm the messenger of God sent to you all. Musaddiqal lima bayna yadaya min at tawradi. Confirming the revelation which came before me. Wa mubashiram bi rasulin ya'ti min ba'd ismuhu Ahmad. And giving glad tidings of a prophet to come after me, a messenger to come after me, whose name shall be Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad. So in the absence of that written word Muhammad or Ahmad, we have to reason with them. And there is also a tape available. At the moment, I have not been able to complete this book of mine, Muhammad the Natural Successor to Christ, that deals with this topic. But a videotape is available, I think from Brother Hamid Ghazali, and that deals with this, and you might be able to get a, quite a few more points on this topic. And let's give somebody else a chance now. The brother here. See, the Christians of South Africa, they live by this curse. Christians of South Africa. You see, they read in the book of Genesis, chapter 9, that after the flood, Nuh alayhi salam, Noah, the prophet Noah, and his three sons, Sam, Ham, and Japheth, they started growing grapes. And from the fruit of the vine, they fermented wine. And Nuh alayhi salam, according to the Bible, drank too much. And he was lying naked, you know, spread out. So out of his three sons, Sam, Ham, and Japheth, Ham, H-A-M, Ham, same spelling as the piece of pig, same. He behaved like a pig. He laughed at his father's nakedness. <laughs> Look at the old man, his father, spread out, naked. But the other two, they felt ashamed of the father's nakedness. They took a piece of cloth and they walked backwards and they covered up the father. In the meantime, the father knew what was going on. But he was too dead drunk, according to the Bible, to do anything about it. When he comes to his soberness, now he curses, and he curses. Cursed be Canaan, for a servant of servant thou shalt be unto thy brethren. So that is the curse. And the white people of South Africa, they believe that we are the children of Ham, all the black peoples of the earth. You see, and they are, the white races are the children of Sam and Japhet. So we are to be the slaves, the carriers of wood, you know, the bearers of wood and water, do all the menial work. So the white man in South Africa, he can't get reconciled to the Indian, the African, the colored who becomes rich. You know, we also have some of our Mercedes Benzes. We also have air conditioned homes. We also have swimming pools in our homes. He can't understand it. He said, look, these are an accursed people. They were supposed to be the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. They were supposed to work for us in our mines and in our factories and sweep our streets and carry our shit buckets. That is the privilege of these black races. And look at them. He can't get reconciled. But he can do nothing about it. He can't grab it because it's a, we sweated for every cent or pence that we have earned. But at the back of his mind, this is the role he's playing, that he is the Israelite in Africa. He is the Israelite. You see, he reads the Bible and he, he projects himself into the Bible, the roles. You know, we all do that. You know, when you go and see films, you know, the hero, we are with him. You know, even if he does things wrong, we want him to get away with it, no? Yes, you know, because our sympathies, they build up a sympathy for the 
for the character. Similarly, now, while they're reading this, the sympathy is for the Jews. And they put themselves in the position of the Jews, that we are the Bani Israel in Africa. And these black people, Indians, Africans, and colors, are the Palestinians. So it's our destiny to <laughs> rule them. But now, this prophecy. You see where it says, Cursed be Canaan, for a servant of servant thou shalt be unto thy brethren. And I have been asking learned men of Christendom. I said, who saw his father's nakedness and laughed? They say, Ham. And I said, who is Canaan? You know, is the man, look, he's still drunk. Look, when he was drunk, we understand what happened. Now he's sober and he curses. And who is he cursing? Not Ham. He's cursing Canaan. I said, why Canaan? And believe me, no Christian wrote the name, even Jimmy Swaggart or his father can answer that. Why Canaan? <laughs> and is God blind? That look for somebody else's sin, he goes and curses, has somebody else cursed. Is he also blind? If God is also blind? No. Then why this Canaan? You see, in the chapter 9 of Genesis, you read again now, you'll note that every time the name Ham is mentioned in the chapter, it says, and Ham the father of Canaan, and Ham the father of Canaan, and Ham the father of Canaan. So when you finish, you think Ham and Canaan are synonymous terms, which are not. Ham had four sons, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. He was the youngest of the grandson of Nu. Why would he leave the culprit, leave the three other brothers of his, and curse this little infant fellow? Why? Ask him. Is the man still drunk? Or is God blind? No. This is man-made book. The book is man-made. This is not the book of God. So the guy who had the pen in his hand, very few people were able to read or write in those days. Like in Arabia, there were only about half a dozen people in the whole of Arabia in the time of our Nabi Karim who could read and write. Abu Jahl was one of those. So very few people. And if you had something against Didat, oh, you can introduce me into the book. As Lot, as Lut, as Noah, as Nu, as Ham, all this you can do because you've got the pen in your hand. This is the book of man. This is how it has worked. But otherwise, make them to account for it. Who is Canaan and who is Ham? Why should this man know if in his righteous indignation, if he cursed Ham and said, you, you be cursed and your children and your children's children for eternity. We can understand. He should have had no right to do that. But we can understand man's anger. You know, you speak like that. But he leaves the culprit out. And he leaves the three other brothers, of, three other sons of his, and he picks up the innocent little child. You know why? Because Canaan became famous in history. So this, whatever family this guy belonged, he had something against the Canaanites. So this is the concoction, the word of man. So Allah says, So woe to them who write the book with their own hands. Then they say, this is from Allah. That they may reap some little reward. So woe to them for what they write. And woe to them for what they earn. Mr. Chairman, this is the last. Pastor Dawan and Alhamdulillah. There is one question from the sisters, but I guess what we can do is, uh, if you don't mind, even though you said it's a far and one.
was born of two people who were not married to each other. Therefore, we, we find... Yes, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Therefore, we find the recurring theme of sin, uh, of Jesus to righteousness and impropriety throughout the history of the Bible. I would like to ask you to address the point in Christianity, since we know that we, we accept the fact that we are all sinners, we are all incapable of finding our own salvation, I'd like you to address the point of what, how can a Muslim find personal salvation? Because we know, even the woman who was caught in adultery, she was not the only guilty person in that group. Every man who was standing there to condemn her to be told out, they didn't want to stand and throw a stone at her because they, beginning with the eldest, even to the last, knew they were all sinners. Therefore, I would just like to um, say that I think that in Christianity, we identify the need for a personal savior. And do you feel that that's the case also in Islam? I, I think, Mr. Chairman, my daughter there, you know, has raised so many issues, you know, in a brief, very few minutes. I don't know whether I'll be able to do justice to them all. But uh, talking about opponents or enemies, you see, you can take this word in the sense that the Christian is using it. He is calling us heathens. If you read the books written by your own people, they say, how lost are the heathen? You know, heathen means kafirs. And who are they? All that are not Christians are heathens, kafirs, we, unbelievers. I know that you wouldn't consider us unbelievers, but this is what your people say. My friend, Jimmy Swaggart, you know, I'm listening to his talk on the video, and he says, uh, he says, I love you all, all. But, he says, if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, as your God and Lord, you are not my brother then what am I? He said, you are not my brother. He repeats. So I said, look, these are rhetorics. These are rhetorics. You can also pass my statements also as a rhetoric. But coming to the main point, you see, about every being born, everybody born in sin, I said, this is the Christian concept. We do not believe so. And the Bible doesn't teach so. You see, in the book of Luke, first chapter, Elizabeth, and her husband, you read there twice, Elizabeth, it says, was sinless. And her husband, Zechariah, was sinless. Jesus speaks about Abel. It says, from righteous Abel to Zechariah, you kill the prophets. Who the Jews? He, did he say righteous? Did he say righteous? It's in your book. If he says righteous, that means he was what was speaking with a tiny cheek. He was bluffing the people. If he said righteous, then they must have been righteous. So you say everybody is a sinner. I said, look, why should you, you know, label everybody with the same brush? Paint everybody with the same brush. You have no right to do that. And God Almighty tells us in the Bible, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, he the Lord had made man upright, but he had sought out many inventions. These are all your concoctions, your creation. He didn't make you so. If he created us as sinners, then what right has he to expect us to get up and walk straight? If I'm born a sinner, I'm weighted down with the lodestone of sin, and he wants to expect me to wait, walk straight. I say, he's unjust. He's unjust. The God who loads me up, you load your little child and say, come on, straight up, straighten up. You've got a, a soldier's haversack on his back. You know, you're a four-year-old, a five-year-old, and the poor fellow is almost, you know, uh, meeting the ground. And you say, why don't you stand up straight and walk? He says, you are unjust. We'll say, you are a lunatic. God Almighty, if he does the same thing to us, he also will describe him as a lunatic. You see, this idea of sin inherited, this is Christianity. You talk about the original sin, that sin came into the world. But the Bible doesn't say that. In the book of Ezekiel, God says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Have you heard that before? Yes. Every Christian preacher, lecturer, evangelist quotes this, and he puts a full stop. He puts a full stop in a verse which has no full stop. 
See, where is supposed to be a comma or a semicolon, the Christian puts a full stop. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Then he takes you out from there into Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, and he says, everyone has sinned. So everyone dies unless somebody comes along and redeems him of that curse. I said, look, listen, read it further. He says, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Father Adam, he made a mistake. Mother Eve made a mistake. And they paid more than the full price. If you, somebody goes and plucks some fruits in your garden, they were told not to. What do you do? You chase the child out. You might give it a spanking. But now you follow that child up, his children and his children, his grand, great grandchildren for eternity. Can you imagine a God like that, a Shylock, worse than a Shylock? Adam and Eve, they sinned. So God kicks them out of the garden. I'm asking, is that not punishment enough? Then he curses them, that you woman, you must bear children in pain and suffering, labor, uh, for, for, for what you have done. And man, you must sweat for your bread. And we are all sweating and you are all laboring. As a result of what Adam and Eve did. Is, not, is that not enough? No, not for this Shylock of a God that you convey to us. He goes on now and said, every human kind on earth must go to hell. At the beginning of 1986, we were 4.8 billion human beings on earth. And everyone goes to hell, says the Christian. For what? For the original sin, unless you believe in Christ. I'm asking, did Eve ask you, my sister, before eating the apple? Did she? No. Did Adam ask you before eating the apple? No. <laughs> then I said, how can God hold you responsible? Is he a lunatic? This God of ours is a lunatic. He's going to hold me responsible for what Adam and Eve did when I was not consulted. I don't know if you were consulted by Eve. Then you have a right to be cursed. <laughs> what kind of a God is this? So he says, says the, uh, and the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Whatever good thing the good man does, he gets his reward. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn, from all the sins that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Did you read that in your Bible? Do you read that in your Bible? Book of Ezekiel, yeah. chapter 20. But righteousness is also as much of a free gift as faith is in, Christian, in the Christian understanding. Righteousness is a gift from God, just like eternal life is a gift from God. So we don't have righteousness on our own. When you compare, my sister, Look, you see, the Christian world has really gone down the drain, according to Jimmy Swaggart. According to his books, you must read them. If you haven't got them, you must get them. On sodomy, homosexuals, get that. On pornography, get it. On incest, get it. On alcohol, get it. And he's telling you, America, he's telling America, he says, America, he says, God must judge you. And if he doesn't, he said he might have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for what he did to them. This is Jimmy Swaggart talking. This is where you have gone. After 2,000 years of Christianity, look, you're sodomites. Here in New York, you have one million more women than men. If every man in New York gets married, there'll be one million women who can't get husbands. Yeah. And out of your manpower you have here, one third are gays, sodomites. One third are gays. Your prison population, 98% are men. And men will have cold feet for so many different reasons. Can you imagine your problem? There are 7.8 million more women in America than men. If every man in America got married, there will still be 7.8 million who can't get husbands. And we know every man will never get married. You know that for so many reasons. So there are about 20 million more women in America who can't get husbands. 20 million who can't get husbands. What's the solution? Hallelujah, hallelujah. I said, what's wrong with you, are you sick? The person is hungry, he says, hallelujah, and his stomach will be filled. The woman, she needs man, and he says, hallelujah, and her, 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 she'll be satisfied. I said, something wrong with you. You had, I give you the figure, 44 million, 40, 55 million, according to Jimmy Swaggart, who are drunkards. With all your born again, your Billy Graham, in his book, How to be Born Again, he says there are 75 million born again Christians in America. 75 million. That's about one third, is it? One third of your population. I said, amazing. One third of your nation is born again, immaculate. The spirit is in them. 
They can't be tempted. The old you, Swagat says, is now left behind. You are a new you now. You are a new person. 75 million, one third, and it doesn't affect the population. You know, Jesus said, a little leaven leavened the whole. You need a little yeast to ferment the loaf. If one third of your bread is yeast, and if it doesn't ferment the loaf, there's something wrong with your yeast or something wrong with your flour. <laughs> Can you see? So, so I say, my dear child, I say there's something wrong with your flour. See? As well as your yeast. You haven't got it. You haven't got answers to the problem. So Jesus is telling you, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. And if I quote this verse again, with a little emphasis on the pronouns, you will see that it is not the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit or the spook that you are thinking about. Listen, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify me. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. I said, it ill befits a ghost, a spook, or a spirit. You agree? Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. He's talking about a man, a man, a man, a man, and not a ghost or a spirit. And he'll guide you into all truth, meaning he'll supply Solution to all your problems. You haven't got them. Your surplus women, ask Jimmy Swaggart and your Falwell and your Billy Graham, ask them what is the answer. Speechless. You haven't got the answer, so he hasn't written a book on polygamy. Swaggart, about surplus women, he doesn't write. Why doesn't he write? You know why? He's written more than 30. I own them. He won't touch this subject. You know why? You haven't got the answer. There are others where he quotes, the answer is there, but he, as if he hasn't seen it. You know, Jesus said, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. About your sodomies and your lesbians, he's quoting a verse in his book on homosexuals. He starts that book, two and a half page quotation. Imagine a quotation lasting two and a half page, first page, second page, and another half page, two and a half page quotation from the book of Romans in which he quotes, in that verses, in those verses, he quotes the reason for this sickness. He's saying homosexuals, it's cause and it's cure. That's the title of the book. So he quotes, and I'm quoting now, he says, professing themselves to be wise, they're very clever people, they became fools and changed the glory of the imperishable God into an image like unto perishable man. The concept of God, you brought it down from that God Almighty, the Heavenly Father, omnipotent, eternal, immortal, you know, permeates the whole universe. From that concept, you brought him down to the level of a man. And further, is, and changed the glory of the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Look, it's so simple. Basic English. He's quoting two and a half. And he says, for this cause. I want you to read that. Romans. I forget the reference. It's the first Romans. Romans chapter 4, verse 22, 23, 24 years. You read that. He says, for this cause, I made your women to go for women and your men to go for men. For this cause. He says, the cause. And it's cure. He's telling you for this cause. What cause? You now brought God the Almighty down to the level of a man. You're serving a man instead of the supreme being. You're worshipping and, and, and serving a creature instead of the creator. Now who is he talking about? You Christians. You are the one who brought God down to this level. We said God must come down to earth. He won't understand our problems otherwise. You know, he must understand how we feel. He's so, he's so loving, he came down to earth and he lived, born of a woman, he carried him for nine months, born like any other human child, circumcised on the eighth day, growing like any other human being, eating food and call, it, call of nature, running to the toilet. God, you brought him down to that level. For that, God says, as I give you punishment, your women will become lesbians and your men become sodomites. Why don't you? Why, look, you read the whole book. And by God, he says, for this cause, the book says, it's cause and it's cure. That word is never used as if he never read it. So Jesus said, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. They already made up their minds. 
But this exercise, I say, is for those who have eyes to see, ears to hear. Let them hear. That, look, you are not reading the book. When you're reading it, you're misunderstanding it, you're misinterpreting it. Please, do, do us a favor. I say, please talk to us. We want to have a dialogue with you. We want to talk to you. You see? And see our point of view. Maybe we are wrong. We want you to reprogram us as we want to reprogram you. But the language is me, myself. I just can't help it. I am born a militant fellow in a militant family. My father was militant. I am militant. My brothers are all militant. And I can't help it, you know. My voice, my size, everything, you know, creates that impression that I'm fighting you. I'm scolding you. But you know, my child, I'm not doing that. This is my nature. I just can't help it. So you'll forgive me for my tone, everything. But I mean well. Please. <laughs> We have to break for other prayer uh, because we have very little time left. So I have one announcement here that uh, the videotapes of uh, Brother Ahmad Didad are available by Hamid Ghazali, Brother Hamid Ghazali, and they are available right here. And if you need more information, please do contact us here, the Muslim Student Association at Columbia University or Masjid al Taqwa in Brooklyn, who are the co-sponsors for this particular occasion. And again, I thank uh, Brother Ahmad Didad for coming over and enlightening us for the wonderful talk and for your patience for staying in here in this warm environment. JazakAllah. The Azan is going to be given right away. Brother Ahmad, please. The address here is the Muslim Student Association of Columbia University, New York, 10027. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Dear brothers and sisters in Islam We appeal to you to help us promote the deen al-Islam Help us promote the word of Allah, the Holy Quran We dear listeners do not view you as ordinary mortals but we view you as the soldiers of Allah, inflamed with the true love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one and only true God. And we believe sincerely that you are serious about your role as a Muslim. You know as well as we do that Islam is constantly under attack and being misrepresented in every possible way. We Muslims should see this as a challenge and heavy responsibility to spread the truth of Islam whilst there is still time. 